This is BBC One with Kirsty Young and Crime Watch. Tonight on Crime Watch, they died in each other's arms. Then I had to go and tell my sister that she had survived and they hadn't. Who murdered Sally Ann Baxter Smith and her daughter Lois? And welcome to Crime Watch. We're live and with dozens of Britain's top detectives, hoping that your call will be the one that has them knocking down doors tonight. We had some great results last month, which we'll tell you about later. But tonight, will you be the person who solves that horrific arson which killed a mum and a daughter? And also on the programme, we desperately need your help on, I have to say, one of the most disturbing cases we've ever come across. The rape of a heavily pregnant woman by an armed robber in her own home. What do you want? What do you want? <laughs> and it's strictly business tonight as well as this bunch. I'm after the thugs who beat a young lad to within an inch of his life. Plus, how undercover agents cracked a multi-million pound heroin smuggling ring after a wily customs officer sniffed out drugs woven into rugs. But first tonight, a case that has left a community in fear. This is nine-year-old Louis Enkel with his only son, Clive. They'd lived together in the small Essex village of Abridge all their lives. Clive was naturally protective of his elderly dad. And so when con men ripped Louis off, Clive reported the incident to the police. What happened next is beyond comprehension. But it meant that Louis had to watch his son die. So I met him in the hospital. He didn't speak, just lay there, and I, I knew he was gone. Clive were very, very close. They were like uh, two peas in a pod. They lived in, the, in Abridge for 50 years in that house um, with Auntie Vera, and then she died, and then it just left Clive and Uncle Lou. Clive was a lovely chap. We were very compatible. He's a lovely son, and he looked after me, you see. He used to cook me food, help me to bath, and everything. That was since my wife died, you know, and that was quite all right with me. We were getting along fine. In spring 2007, a middle-aged man turned up at Clive and Lewis' home. He was touting for gardening work. The trees are just down here. Oh, yeah. It's these conifers I want cutting down, mate. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. How, how much is that going to be? £400 for cash. 400? Yeah. OK. I, I want it done today, though. It's got to be cash, though. Yeah, OK. I okay. got that. Yeah. All right, I'll do that. Well, they came and he only sawed one barrel. You haven't finished yet, mate, have you? No, I haven't finished. Just going to need to get a bigger saw. OK. Don't be long. No, I won't. His mate came into the house and saw where I was getting the money and he snatched the money out of my hand and was gone. Hey! hey what do you think you're doing? I did feel we'd been ripped off. Really, I did. And that's what upset my son, you see. Oh, yeah. Uh, do me a favour, would you, son? Go into the chemist when you go out and pick up my prescription. Yeah? Yeah, of course, Dad. I'll go in a minute. No hurry. Whatever. You expecting somebody? Well, the man came back, and I saw him through the window. Hi, oh, mate. Two trees cut down. No, you came last time and never done the job properly. Well, I'll do it properly this time. No, we, we, we give you £400. We don't want anything else doing. No, go away. Go on, F off! He sauntered off. We watched him. And he stood and looked back. I must have said he was going to 
get the evidence or something, and then he drove off. We don't know exactly what was said during the argument, but clearly the exchange was heated. And afterwards, word the bogus caller may return, Clive reported him to the police. This is Police Control Room. Good morning. How may I help you? Oh, um, we've got, got uh, a couple of con men working this area, I believe. So have you had anyone knock today? Yeah, we've had somebody wanting to do a tree. OK. And this fella turned up, I don't know, a year or, or two back. But I recognise we, we had him before. What's this, said? He's tenders, Dad. I just want to see what happens. Right. Oh, God. Found the police, Dad. The attackers, armed with baseball bats, cornered Clive in his bedroom. He didn't stand a chance. Blow after blow, they repeatedly struck Clive around the head and left him for dead. I met him in the hospital, he didn't speak or just lay there and I, I knew he was gone. The doctors did all they could to save Clive, but it wasn't enough. And after two days, Louis, then aged 89, watched his son die. I never saw him alive again. So I've still got memories and different things of him. <laughs> So what do we know about the gang that killed Clive? Were they with the bogus caller that Clive had earlier told to go away? Here is an e-fit of that man. He is about five foot ten tall, in his late forties, with a round face and brown grey in hair. Do you know this man, or did you see him in the Abridge area on the 25th of September, the night of the attack? We have traced the gang's getaway vehicle, a silver BMW M3. It was stolen earlier in the day from a village in Cambridgeshire. Also stolen was a gun cabinet containing a Beretta shotgun. Where was that vehicle between 3 o'clock in the afternoon and 8 o'clock in the evening when it turned up at Louis and Clive's village? After the attack, the car was dumped two miles away from the house at the local sewage works. The stolen gun cabinet and gun have never been recovered. Uncle Lou has been really affected by Clive's death and he had to leave his home because he wouldn't be able to look after himself on his own now. They've really affected uh, an old man's life. After losing, you know, his only child, his companion, his soulmate. This is the most harrowing case I have come across during my 17 years within the police. For a man who helped others, Clive died in the hands of a gang who don't care about human life. They need to be caught tonight. It's the worst thing I've ever had happen to him in my life, really. You can accept a, an accident, but not murder. I'm joined now by D.I. and Cameron. He seems like such a lovely man, Louis, and there he is left with nothing but his... He said it, nothing but his memories. How's he doing now? Louis is a very strong person, but he is now 90, and as a result of the murder, he has had to move out of his home. Um, horrendous, that attack. So full of violence. Do you think it was a revenge attack? We do believe it was, or if not, there is a big coincidence, because the drawer where Louis used to keep his money yeah. was pulled right open. OK. Um, let's take a look then, Anne, at the E-fits. Just give us the descriptions of these guys again. OK. The man who arrived to cut the tree was in his 40s with a plump round face. Mm -hmm. He had brown grey in hair and was about 5 foot 10 inches tall. Mm -hmm. The men on the night of the attack, one man was wearing a black and grey top and two of the other men were in their early 20s and they were brandishing what we believe to be baseball bats. 
I would ask anybody, if you recognise these men from the description, or if you know who these men are, or if you've been targeted by cold callers in the Abridge area, to please ring. OK, all of that will help. Let's concentrate for a moment on the car. This car had been stolen, stolen in Cambridgeshire. It was uh, a BMW. Tell us what else you know. Yes. After the attack, the gang dumped the car at a sewage works about two miles from where Clive lived. It was, as you say, a silver BMW M3. OK, people can check out the details of that online. Um, you got the car. Didn't get the gun, though. No. The gun was an up-and-over Beretta. Uh, sorry, sorry. Over-and-under Beretta shotgun. And there was also some blue shotgun cartridges and a grey metal gun safe. OK, well, we're seeing all of those. And thank you very much for that. I mean, you saw that. These men are very dangerous. They must be caught. They will just do it again. If you can help, call us now. Do it for Louis, 0500 600 600. Or if you'd like to remain anonymous, that's fine by us. You can call the independent charity Crime Stoppers. I should tell you they're offering a five grand reward for information leading to a conviction. Let me give you their number. It is 0800 treble 5 treble 1. If you want to see the reconstruction again for the details, it's online, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Now let's go over to Rav. He's got the first of tonight's Most Wanted. Now three from last month are already behind bars, so can we better that this month? First up is Ben Smith. Police want to speak to him about an attempted murder in Hertfordshire in August. The victim was stabbed in the chest with a broken bottle and repeatedly beaten around the head. His injuries are so severe he needs plastic surgery. Smith has links to Great Yarmouth, St Albans and Bedfordshire. My number two here is George Kacharian, wanted in connection with an investment scam. One victim alone was conned out of £12 million. Kacharian is 57, originally from Denmark, and often travels between the UK and Europe, especially to Germany. Next up is Jeffrey Dewar, a.k.a. Jojo, and he's involved in an export racket in which high-value cars like BMWs and Mercedes are stolen and then shipped to Kenya. Originally from Ghana, Dua also uses the names James Asan and Peter Asari. He was last seen in October in Tottenham, North London, sporting short Afro hair and a very thin moustache. And number four is Michael Farrell, a very nasty piece of work, after being charged with burglary in Merseyside last May. He went on the run and hasn't been seen since. He's now added manslaughter, firearms offences and arson to the list of crimes he's wanted for. There's a five grand reward on his head for information leading to his arrest. So, if you know where Farrell or any of the others are hiding out tonight, pick up the phone now. 0500 600 600 or you can text us on 63399. Just type crime, space and any message and it's important to leave that space or your message won't get through. And you can also check these mugshots out online. bbc.co.uk forward slash crime watch. And remember, our most wanted stay on our website until they're caught. Now still ahead, can you help us with this? The disturbing case of a heavily pregnant woman raped by an armed robber in her own home. <laughs> I'm telling him I was pregnant and begging him not to hurt me. And uh, he said it was my lucky day. Uh, Recognise this handwriting with our experts and analysis. Can you help the national domestic extremist team identify who's behind a shocking and vicious hate mail campaign? And how a mobile phone and a rug like this led undercover agents to the man behind a multi-million pound drug smuggling ring. So all of that is still to come. Now this is Lois Baxter Smith. When she was just a little girl, she's with her pet dog, Hetty. It's one of the only remaining photos of her because six years ago she was killed with her mother when their home was deliberately set on fire. The murderer has never been caught. We were a really close family. The fire in Five Beach Road. I just remember all the good times that we did have. Three fire inside. She always makes it even sadder. No run away. It's always in the back of your mind that Lois and Mum aren't around her share Christmases and birthdays. They should be here. We miss them very much. I miss them very much. In the early hours of the 6th of September 2003, 
An arson at this property in Beach Road, Eastbourne, destroyed the lives of the Baxter Smith family who were asleep inside. They were targeted in a deliberate attack. We don't know who did it or why, but someone does, and they have murder on their conscience. I've been friends with Sally Ann for 15, nearly 15 years. She was a really fun, loving person, and she'd always be playing with the kids. And we'd all sit around the dining room table like one big family. The bond between Mum and I were, it was very, very strong. Very strong. Me and Rhiannon were a little bit more independent and did our own thing. But for Lois, she really clung on to Mum. I mean, that Philip, what was he doing? Oh, no, come on in. Let's have a look at you. Oh, Rhiannon, you look fantastic. Come on, Lois, show us your new uniform. Oh, Mum. Oh, you look gorgeous. Mum didn't really want to let Lois out of her sight. We were trying to wrap her up in cotton wool because she'd been through so much with bullying and her dad not being around. Oh, look at the type of I'm going to have to go. Oh, yeah. So I follow Jay. Yeah. It's getting late, probably about midnight, and um, I decided that I wanted to go home. My son was asleep on the sofa, and I didn't want to disturb him. So I just left and went home. It's bedtime, girls. Bedtime. Oh, Come on, please. Oh, please. has fought their way into 14-year-old Lois's bedroom. There, on the bed, were the bodies of mother and daughter, with their arms wrapped around each other. Lois had been brought out and she wasn't... She wasn't... She wasn't moving. Not breathing. And we got to the hospital. I sat with Rhiannon and I uh, got called into a room with my stepfather to be told that they'd died and they hadn't made it. And then I had to go and tell my sister. I had to tell Rhiannon that she'd survived and they hadn't. Which is one of the hardest things I ever had to do. <laughs> so what do we know about the events of that night? We believe whoever set that fire knew that they could get round the back of the house using this alleyway and a window at the back of the house, which was usually left open. Does that mean that Sally Ann and her children were known by their killer?
It's been six years since an innocent mother and child were murdered, and that's a long time to keep a secret. Someone knows who did this, and to them I'd say, please come forward, do the right thing, and bring the killer to justice for Sally Ann, Lois, and their family. Lois had asked to stay at mine that night, and I'd said no, because I was going away the next day. But if I'd said yes, she'd still be here, and so would my mum, because my mum woke up and wouldn't leave the house without Lois. And that guilt gets away at me every day. Every single day. Well, DCI Trevor Bowles, who's heading up the investigation, we saw him there in the reconstruction, has joined us in the studio. Chelsea says she's feeling this guilt, but, it, but it's grief. It's the weight of the grief, and this family's been torn apart by what happened six years ago. Kirsty, this has had a devastating effect on the family and, of course, the other people who are in the property. And we're determined to catch the person who committed this wicked act. Let's see if we can help you. What do you know for certain about what happened on the night and into the early morning of when the fire took place? Well, the fire was set at about 5 a.m. We do know that about 1 o'clock that morning, Sally Ann's partner at the time was at the front of the property, right. creating a little bit of a commotion, trying to get into the house, and that was seen by some of the neighbours. He was spoken to in the initial inquiry into this dreadful act, and I can absolutely guarantee that he's not a suspect in this inquiry. OK, that's important, but it is then around about 5am that somebody else appears on the scene. Yes, indeed. The property is accessed by a, an alleyway, which we've just seen, at the back of the house right. and that, and that ac accesses a window which was regularly left open so, and that was where the fire was started. Now as you said in the film there Trevor, you know six years is a long time to keep a secret, do you think somebody in the community holds the key? I'm absolutely certain that somebody out there knows who did this and why. It's a long time, six years, to hold a secret. Okay, you should do the right thing if you know anything about the events of that night. If you want to get it off your conscience, you should. Call us now, 0500 600 600. Now here's Rav with some criminals caught on camera. Comedy crooks, thieves and thugs are all in this month's CCTV. It's nine in the evening and this shifty looking lot are up to no good outside this electrical wholesalers in Camberley, Surrey back in February. Using a large wrench, they smash in the door and crawl through. That's better. We can see you now. They quickly get to work robbing the place, but they're more chuckle brothers than criminal masterminds. To me, to you. Hands full. Oh, watch the plug. Wait a minute, vacuum cleaner? Anyway, they nick thousands of pounds of electrical equipment and hundreds in cash, then make a getaway in this stolen Mercedes Sprinter van. And it's not the first time they've struck. Here's them in action again at a wholesaler's near Heath Road. Twice in one weekend, they've got some nerve, but here's something to make them sweat. As well as being caught on camera during the burglary, they were also filmed on their recce. Then they wish they'd spotted that camera. Names, please. Check out this bloke at Benfleet train station in Essex in May. He looks innocent enough, but don't be fooled. He's wanted for robbing a 65-year-old man in his own home. The victim was hit around the face, tied up, and then locked in a cupboard under the stairs before being robbed of cash and valuable jewellery like this porcelain watch. Recognise the face? Call time on him tonight. Two shops at opposite ends of the country, both done over by this couple who've nicked thousands of pounds worth of stuff. If that's their idea of fun, they need more than retail therapy. Here they are helping themselves at a gift shop near Hull in June 2007. And at it again at a jeweller's in Exeter, Devon, in May last year. Each time they pose as customers, waiting until the shop assistant is distracted before pocketing valuable items and making a sharp exit. This devious duo is operating up and down the country. Who are they? The number 25 bus in East London this July. It's early in the morning and things are about to kick off. 
one guy has come to give a group of lads a piece of his mind after they insulted his girlfriend. It's a big mistake. They all pile off and with one punch he's sent flying, almost falling under the moving bus. And they don't stop there. Whilst he lies helplessly on the pavement, two of them take turns to punch, kick and bottle him. This is a horrific attack. The victim was lucky to have survived. Take a good look at them. If you know them, make the streets safer and name them tonight. Recognise anyone? Then you know what to do. 0500 600 600 or you can text us on 63399. Just type crime space and then your message. And it's important to leave that space or your message won't get through. And if you need a second look at tonight's CCTV, it's also online. bbc.co.uk forward slash crime watch. Now, imagine receiving this through your letterbox. Scrounging Asian and black scum minorities breeding like lice into our country. Like you, 85% living completely off English tax, bleeding us dry. You've destroyed England. Your time is up with us. Nice. It's just one example taken from scores of letters sent to doctors, head teachers and even pensioners who've been the target of a hate mail campaign. So serious are detectives taking the threats that the National Domestic Extremist Team has been called in to investigate. Well, tonight we are joined by D.I. Donna Goff of Hampshire Police, who are leading up that investigation, and linguistics expert Dr. Tim Grant, who's going to give us an insight into the writer in the hope that you might be able to identify them tonight. Donna, first of all to you, um, what's the scale of the letter writing and who's the hate aimed at? So far we've identified 57 letters in the series over a span of two years. Um, all of the letters have very much a pro-English, um, anti-Scottish Parliament um, and anti-ethnic minorities, mentions immigrants, asylum seekers and the like. Um, of course, 57 may be the tip of the iceberg. We are aware that some people don't report okay. this type of crime. Yes, a lot of people just throw it in the bin and think, what a load of nonsense. Now, um, it's individuals, as you've said, also organisations that are targeted. Yes, we've had um, letters sent to um, a primary school that taught ethnic minority children. We've had one sent to an individual widow who had lost her husband. It was actually sent to her husband, which was very distressing. Indeed. We've had them sent to the NHS, doctors, dentists, mosques many, many places. Um, now, of course, you've been doing, I mean, forensically examining them. We'll talk to Tim about that in a second, but actually literally forensically examining them. Yes. You've got DNA. Yes. We believe a female is involved in this, and it may not be a woman necessarily writing the letters. We need to keep an open mind. However, we do believe a woman is involved in some way, maybe sending or helping to post, and it may, of course, be that someone in a post office recognises the handwriting or the individual from their views that might be able to help us. Okay, and you say posting. Posting from is Portsmouth, is it? Yes, most of the postmarks have been Portsmouth and the Isle of Wight, some from Southampton. Um, so we think it's, it's likely to be a resident of Hampshire. Uh, Tim, might... you've looked at these letters in detail. What do you think about the, the female angle on this? Okay. That strikes yeah, me as unusual. Yes, the assumption can be that these sort of letters are written by a man rather than a woman. But, but we have run some analysis which, which would support the idea that it might be a female. Um, That's to do with language, is it? Yes, to do with the language they use, so, so a heavier ad adjective use, and in particular adjectives like smelly and filthy and squalor. Are you able to, I don't know if you are, sort of narrow it down to age groups? Can, can you tell yeah. from the sort of language that's used? Oh, they they appear to person? be claiming to be older. They're, so okay. in, in, in their letters they're writing about pensions, they're writing that people um, who, who have worked for 50 years or more of their lives. But there's also some language evidence which might support that. They're using older terms of abuse. They're using wogs and half-castes and negroes as terms of abuse. And um, what about the, the language as well? There are some pretty, not, not really florid phrases, but just unusual phrases. No, that's right. They, in terms of age, they refer to the elderly English, but also more unusual phrases like English ancestral beds and English ancestral hospitals. Yeah, um, Donna, tell me a little bit about... We've got some pictures here as well. I mean, what do you make of those? They're quite well drawn as it they happens. They are. They're very stylised, the pictures, and, and as you can see, we have some that are, that are quite similar, that are repeated. Um, most of the um, letters have an English flag on them, um, which is quite distinct, distinctive as well. So. And what about when they were sent? I mean, has there been any apparent trigger for the person firing off these letters? Well, um, many have been sent to the NHS and the type of language that's been used indicates there may well have been an incident involving the NHS which may have sparked some of the letters. Um, also, some of them appear to have been response to media and certainly we've had clippings from the Daily Mail that have been sent with some letters. Uh, thanks, Donna. Thanks to you, Tim, as well.
as well. Um, if you think you recognize that handwriting, indeed, if you want to take a closer look at it, we've got plenty samples on the website, so do click on to our web link and have a look. And then you can pick up the phone. 0500 600 600 is the number to dial. Now, here's Rav with some more faces in the frame. And for a change, they're not all men. My number five is Lee Wolonski, wanted for the serious assault and abduction of a woman in Edinburgh two years ago. Now, he was charged, but skipped bail and has been on the run since. He's Polish, has links to the West Midlands as well as Scotland, and you might well see him down the gym because he likes working out. Number six, here she is, uses a number of aliases, including Joanne Peer and Zoe Fletcher. She's wanted for mortgage fraud to the tune of 10 million quid. She's got links to London and Scotland and may speak with a South African accent. Next is sex offender Tony Carr. He's wanted for breaching the conditions of his release and needs finding fast. He has links to the Medway area of Kent and could be looking for work in the Czech and Slovak communities, possibly as a cleaner. And finally, we have Yamin Lajkem Kichuchi, wanted in connection with the murder of 55-year-old John McRae, who was stabbed in North London in July. Known to his mates as M, he's a French Algerian and hangs out in the London boroughs of Islington, Hackney and Haringey. So, where are they hiding tonight? If you know, don't wait. Call us here in the studio, 0500 600 600. Or you can text us on 63399, type crime, space, and then your message. Don't forget to leave that space or your message won't get through. Now, our next case, I have to tell you, is truly disturbing and it's taken great courage for the couple involved to speak out tonight. They've done it in the hope that someone somewhere is going to pick up the phone and name the man who brought terror into their home. Everything that you believe to be safe is no longer safe. You can't walk into the bedroom and feel relaxed because you remember that somebody was in there who wasn't supposed to be in there. And you see shadows and you hear noises and nothing's as safe as it was. With their first baby due in a matter of weeks, the couple at home in North London that night were looking forward to a new chapter in their lives. What are you doing? Looking at babies now. Do you want a cup of tea? The build-up to the birth was was just fantastic. There you go. Couldn't wait, basically. What do you think of Rosie, the girl? Who's that? Don't know. We were a bit on edge because the week before, similar similar things had happened somebody knocking on the door and asking for John or for Mary and uh, saying, sorry, they've got the wrong address. What do you want? What do you want? Shut up! What do you want? They're going to kill me! They're going to kill me! Shut up! Get down! I immediately thought, I should call the police. So I, I went to the phone and then tried to dial the number and hide. I just pleaded. I was shouting, she's pregnant, she's pregnant, leave off her. Tell me what you want. Where are the car keys? Where are the car keys? Where are the car keys? That's in car outside. Where are the car keys? On the kitchen table, please. Please don't hit me. She's pregnant. Stand there! Where are the car keys? I, know. I need to speak. You're not speaking to anyone. Find them! At that stage, I was just wanting to protect my baby. I was absolutely terrified. And being so late in the pregnancy, I didn't want to get into a fight or anything where they might hurt me or hurt the baby. I just wanted to give them whatever they wanted and get them out of the house. Where are the spare keys? We don't have You're lying to me! Wait! <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
I was going through every eventuality. Was this a real gun? Will I be able to get myself out of this situation? Is that going to jeopardize the other situation? Is my partner going to be safe? Is the baby going to be safe? You just sit there and, and you, you can't do anything. No, I just remember telling him what was pregnant and begging him not to hurt me. And uh, he said it was my lucky day. Not getting it. I will shoot your man and you. Now get in there! <laughs> what happened in the bedroom that night is far too disturbing to detail. Suffice to say, if the attacker's caught, he will be prosecuted for rape. How could someone do this to a heavily pregnant woman, you might ask? Was this his intention from the start? And did the other gang members know that he had more than robbery in mind? Get out! Go downstairs! I'm gonna be sick. Pregnancy makes me sick. Just so much racing through your head about the best thing to do, about how to look after yourself and how to look after my baby. So close to having my first child and just not wanting anything to come wrong. Just connect the phone! Come on, Chris! The gang got what they came for and left in the couple's Audi TT. I didn't want my partner to know what had happened upstairs at all. I just remember him coming to hug me and give me a kiss. And I, I wouldn't let him anywhere near me because I didn't want, I had to tell him then because I didn't want him anywhere near me. The gang abandoned the stolen Audi TT here by some garages in Portland Road, Seven Sisters, North London, just two miles from the house that they robbed. Only those with local knowledge would know of this place. So were the gang from round here? It's likely they abandoned the car to see whether it was fitted with a tracker, intending to wait a few days to see if the police would turn up. Does this mean that they'd done this before? They'd certainly worked out a plan. They had a getaway car waiting at the garages. A blue Ford Mondeo. The gang, armed and ready to use violence, forced their way into the couple's home late at night to steal. But that wasn't enough for one of them. He subjected a heavily pregnant woman to a sickening ordeal. What sort of man would do this? How the hell do you plan that in your mind. How the hell do you then live with yourself afterwards? And you're sitting there afterwards chatting with your mates and going that went really well. How, what level do they exist on? Since the attack with having to go through the SDT checks and being told that my baby might be, have to be screened as well, everything You're worried about the health of, of the baby before they're even born, and it's just really unfair to, to think of a new baby having to go through those things. Well, I'm joined by D.I. Rob Peck, who's heading up the investigation. A truly shocking crime. It is appalling to think what that woman went through in her own home. I mean, that somehow makes it so much worse that it happened in a place that she should feel safe in. As you say, truly horrific, um, as all rapes are, but what makes this even more shocking is the fact that she was so clearly and so heavily pregnant. Yeah. Um, do you think they were targeted for the car then? Was that the beginning of the reason? 
As soon as the suspects came through the door, they were demanding the keys and spare keys for the Audi, so clearly this was a motivating factor, we think. Um, in the film, we talked about local knowledge that these guys seem to have. Is it your belief that they, they live and operate locally? I think they'll have a clear connection to the area based on the fact where the vehicle was dumped um, and the local accidents that they have. Uh, Le sorry. Sorry. Uh, let's take a look at this very important CCTV. You want to trace these men. To tell us about it. Absolutely right. These CCTV images were taken on Seven Sisters Road. Um, we're very keen to trace the individuals involved there. If they recognise themselves, they can come forward and contact us. Or if anyone else out there knows who they are, please get in touch. Yeah, I mean, somebody must know who did this. People can take a, a closer look at that CCTV, by the way, on, on our website. Do you think they're going to have blabbed? Yeah, I think so. I think the fact that uh, there are three suspects involved in this offence and with the passage of time, I think it would be very difficult to keep a, a lid on this. They would have talked either to other criminal associates, friends, loved ones, members of their family, and it's those sort of people who are really keen to come forward, do the right thing, and tell us who, who did this. The worst sort of individuals, an absolutely revolting crime. Let me tell you that there is a £20,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. So please, if you've got the slightest suspicion about who might have done this appalling thing, it is worth calling. These men have to be caught. Our number is 0500 600 600. For help and support, if you've been a victim of crime, then there is the victim support line. Let me give you that number. It's 0845 30 30 900. Now here are Matthew and Rab with an update on last month's cases. Well, first, news on the murder of 17-year-old Melanie Road, who was sexually assaulted and stabbed to death in Bath. 25 years ago. Do you like that? Are you sure you don't want me to get you a taxi? Oh, no, I'm going to stop you sure? Yeah. All right. Taxi. I just want to know why and who I'm for somebody to be caught. A man on his rest, but they could do it again. I don't want anybody else to go through. Well, despite the case dating back a quarter of a century, we had an absolutely fantastic response. Dozens of people phoned in, and one caller in particular provided detectives with crucial information. Now, it took a lot of courage to make that call, which we answered here in the studio around 11 o'clock. If you're that woman, you're not in any sort of trouble, but detectives are desperate to speak to you again. Please call back. Do it for Melanie's family. You can speak to that investigating team directly on 01275 814 630. Next, the horrific murder of Birmingham taxi driver Mohammed Arshad, or just Arshad as he was known to his family and friends. Ten weeks ago, the father of three was stabbed in the head six times. Arshad was a family man. His motto was just work hard and do as much good as you can. You know, he was just earning a living for himself, his family. And that's what he was out that night doing. Peter? Yeah. Where to? King's Norton. Last month, we played you a 999 call of a man claiming to be Arshad's killer. Well, following that appeal, police believe they've identified the caller and have charged a 51-year-old man with perverting the course of justice. He'll be in court later this year. Arshad's murderer is still out there. 
We've had some great calls on the night, and using new information, detectives have now put together this e-fit of the man they believe is the killer. If you think you know him, please call us now. The number's there on your screen. It will also be on our website, together with our reconstruction of Arshad's murder. If you need another look, it's bbc.co.uk forward slash crime watch. Now, three months ago, this gang from Birmingham were jailed for a total of 47 years for one of the biggest ever conspiracies to smuggle heroin into the UK. The haul was worth a fortune and was a result of months of painstaking undercover work. The plotter's plan was audacious and, they thought, ingenious. To smuggle drugs into Britain in rugs. Don't want any hold-ups. We've been planning this for months. In January last year, a cargo plane touched down at Birmingham Airport. In its hold, amongst the parcels and packages from all over the world, were three bales of hand-woven rugs. Bound for a depot in Leicester, they looked unremarkable, only they were anything but. The rugs arriving that day were the centrepiece of an international drug smuggling ring worth millions of pounds. The parcels hardly gave anything away, but the documentation caught customs' attention. 25 rugs from Afghanistan, their destination address in the Midlands, and a single contact number, a UK mobile phone. Where has the consignment come in from? If it's a drug source country, and in this case Afghanistan, that would ring the first alarm bell. We examined the paperwork, looking for any anomalies. There was a suspicion there. If something isn't right, it isn't right. And it wasn't. After rolling out the rugs and finding nothing, customs decided to go for broke and started cutting into the rugs. Suddenly, powder was everywhere. The powder that exploded from the rugs was pure heroin. It had been concealed in tiny plastic straws, intricately woven into it. It was clear customs had stumbled upon a huge and sophisticated operation involving months of planning, organisation and help from the drug lords of Afghanistan. Whoever was behind this would not be easy to catch. Within minutes, Soccer, the serious organised crime agency, had been alerted and a specialist team was on their way to Birmingham airport. Their best chance of catching the gang was to follow the rugs to their delivery point. But the rugs were in tatters and the clock was ticking. Why the hell is it taking so long? priority was to make sure that those drugs didn't get onto the streets and so we couldn't therefore allow the original rugs to leave our custody. So we had to immediately find some substitute rugs which would pass for the originals. Hastily, 25 fake rugs were made ready for delivery. Wrapped in the original packaging, Soccer hoped they would stay undiscovered long enough to get a lead to the men behind the plot. Okay, we're set up. I'm going to run this from the command vehicle. I want real-time updates from surveillance. Looks like some kind of distribution warehouse. I don't know if it's got any history. Drug links. Let's go! Within hours, the surveillance team arrived in Leicester. They watched as an undercover officer handed over the dummy rugs. Everything seemed to be going to plan. Mr. Cullen. Then, in front of their eyes, the rugs, unchecked and completely intact, were transferred into a car. Filmed by surveillance moments earlier, the driver had been spotted waiting nearby. It was clear the warehouse was not the final destination. Soccer had to follow. We continued the surveillance with the vehicle that now had the rugs in it. At some point, it went through a red light which the surveillance team couldn't do, otherwise they would have not stayed covert. All they could do was watch as their target disappeared from sight. The car was found abandoned on a side street. It seemed as if all had been lost, but a closer look revealed the rugs were still in the back, untouched and in their original packaging. Why? Was this part of the gang's plan or had they been spooked? We were reasonably confident they would come back to the vehicle because their drugs were in it and that was three quarters of a million pounds for them. The surveillance team watched until out of the blue a low loader appeared. 
The car and the rugs were then driven away. The team followed, not knowing where it would take them, but the long journey finally ended in Spark Hill in Birmingham, where, for a second time, the car was abandoned on a roadside. After 36 hours of surveillance, Soccer decided it was time to take the car in for forensic examination. Until now, they had no real leads, but that was about to change. The driver had made a simple mistake. He'd left an empty drinks bottle in the car. On it were traces of his saliva, minute, but just enough for scientists to extract DNA. It was all that Soccer needed to give them a name. Asif Khan. With a previous conviction for stealing, Khan's DNA was on the national database. After a huge trawl, the team then found images of him on CCTV. The car had been hired by him in Birmingham a few days earlier. It was a breakthrough, a definite link to the gang. They'd worked out their first man, but who were the others? Along with the delivery address, the gang had provided a mobile phone number. Could this be a lead to the other conspirators? It's very much our experience that most of the criminals that we target almost routinely use prepaid mobile telephones because they can't be linked to them subsequently. So unless they're found in possession of them, it's very difficult for us to make the connection. But as analysts started tracing calls made to and from that phone, clear patterns began to emerge. After mapping thousands of calls, finally Soccer worked out the gang's main mobile phone numbers. These would lead them right to their targets. One of those phones had phoned a taxi firm. We were able to make inquiries with the taxi firm, identify who made that call, and from that we got the name and address. That man was Mohammed Faisal Dad. Known and feared within the Asian community in Birmingham, the 24-year-old had always managed to stay one step ahead of the law. Until now, Faisal Dad's number was linked to every other phone. From a single taxi number, they'd found the man behind the plot. We focused then on his call billing and the communications that had gone through his phone. And through that, we were able to identify other members of this network. It took four months from the rug's landing to process the phone data. But they had three more names. 42-year-old Soyab Hansdot, he'd worked at the Leicester warehouse and arranged the delivery using the name of an existing employee oblivious to the plot. Ishmael Magda, 29. He'd been caught before intending to sell drugs and was the link between Birmingham and Leicester. And just 22, Mohamed Ibra had used his bank account to pay for the duty, releasing the parcels for delivery. All unemployed, all from the Midlands, they'd been recruited by Faisal Dad so he could stay one step removed from the actual plot. After months of work, dawn raids took place across the country. Out of the five suspects, three were arrested straight away. But Makhta and Dad had fled. On the run until August, Makhta was finally stopped in a blacked-out Range Rover in Manchester. He actually gave a false name, but unfortunately for him, the person whose name he gave was actually wanted by the police. So he was arrested for that. The search went on for Faisal Dad, and finally they tracked down an address in Birmingham. Had they caught up with the mastermind behind the plot? Had a cursory search to start with and found nothing, but then decided to conduct a more thorough search. Layout's clear. Search all place, lads. Get this covered. And the bed. Yeah, OK, I'm coming out. Crawling on all fours, the conspirator climbed out to face his captor. Mohammed Faisal Dad. It had been a last-ditch attempt, hiding inside the base of a divan bed. As he was taken from his home in handcuffs, Faisal Dad actually laughed. He'd escaped capture for years, and this time he thought it would be no different. He couldn't have been more wrong. In June, he was jailed for more than 10 years. As an individual, Faisal Dad was fairly unremarkable. 24 years of age, of Pakistani descent, as most of that group were, would never really have come to our attention or, or been on our radar. What he'd done himself, thinking he was clever, he had distanced himself by using this network of other similar individuals, either unemployed or in low-paid jobs, to do his dirty work for him. And he thought he was safe. All five pleaded guilty at Birmingham Crown Court. 
They were sentenced in June to a total of 47 years for conspiracy to import Class A drugs. It's pretty ironic, really, that a criminal network, sophisticated as they were with the way they concealed the drugs, brought it into the country, etc., were actually undone by one mobile phone number. Yeah, that's incredible. One phone number on one form. It's amazing. They worked on this phone data for a year. That one number leading them to the gang and, crucially, to the man pulling all the strings. I mean, it also gave them a pattern of calls. At each of the key moments of the plot, there'd be a call from the gang member to Faisal Dad. Faisal Dad would then call the other gang members and give them their next instruction in the plot. And so you develop these flurries of calls and you put that pattern next to the timeline of the conspiracy, and bingo, it's an exact match, these are your guys. And how they got it in, I mean, a few months ago you told us about the old liquid cocaine on the door varnish. Yeah, I mean, every way possible that they think of. I mean, there was a case I heard about today where they tried to smuggle in 80,000 walnuts, and 30 of them, I mean, it really is a needle in a haystack, 30 had been hollowed out and filled with heroin. I mean, it's not that long ago in Mexico, they found 20 sharks, sharks, jam-packed full of drugs. I mean, it's obvious why they are prepared to take the risk, the smugglers. I mean, I'll give you one figure. The value of heroin in Afghanistan compared to how much it's sold on the streets here, there is a markup of over 16,000 percent. Good God. And, and Afghanistan is the big number here. It is. 90 percent comes from Afghanistan. Here, the Home Office think they have about 300 major drug smugglers, the kingpins, and they bring in about 25 tonnes of heroin from Afghanistan every year. But here, in this case, this gang, this kingpin, out of business, behind bars. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, now, here's Rab with what's coming in on the phones. Some good stuff coming in on the Eastbourne arson murder. If you remember, this is going back to 2003. Three calls already, but two names passed to the police. Clive Enkel murder, great response there. 59 calls so far, rising all the time. Loads and loads of names put forward. Any more information on bogus workmen, though, we really need it to be specific to the Abridge area of Essex. More in the update show to follow. Right, that's all for now. Details on all of tonight's cases are online, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. You can log on now for a live update on what's happening here on the phones. I can tell you they have been red hot from the start tonight. The lines are open until midnight tonight and from uh, 7.30 tomorrow morning. Our next programme, well, that's going to be on Wednesday the 28th of October. Don't go away, though, because we're all going to be back after the news with a full update on all of tonight's cases. If you can help but you haven't made that call yet, please do it now. It could all be down to you. I'll see you at 10.35. Bye-bye for now.